one minute, maybe a minute and a half or so. We're live streaming. How many of you had your family or friends watching it on live stream today so they can vote for you? That's a spirit. That's what we like to see. Um, if you have your cell phone on, uh, turn off the noise part of it. You can leave it on, and but turn off that if you don't mind. Thank you. And we're going to give it a few more minutes and let people still come in and grab a seat. Then we'll get started. I'll look for your recording sign, and we're on. So uh, welcome, everybody, and it's really nice to see so many non-participants here. So thank you all for coming and joining us today, and thank you for supporting the University of Texas 3MT competition. Uh, my name is John Dalton. I'm assistant dean for the graduate school, and I've had the pleasure of working with and meeting all of our contestants on multiple occasions, and I think you're in for a treat today. So just for those of you who have not participated uh, or watched the 3MT competition before, we have 10 contestants today who have all competed in a preliminary heat, who have all been successful and moved forward to the final round. Today is the final competition, and we will have some prizes to give out, as well as announcing the winners a little later. So let me get to that. But first of all, I just want to say congratulations and good luck to all of our contestants. Will you guys raise your hand so the audience knows who all of our contestants are? They're all here. So why don't we get them feeling good about themselves and being here by giving them a round of applause and congratulating them. So So we do want to give out special thanks to the Graduate Coordinator Network. Every graduate department has a staff member that basically we could not live without, and that's the Graduate Coordinator. So for all the Graduate Coordinators who are here, thank you. Also to the Professional Network, they are today's sponsors. They will be providing the prize money as well as travel expenses for the winner to go to the regional competition in Knoxville. So please join me in thanking the Graduate Coordinator Network for their financial support. And just as an incentive and a reminder, uh, the top prize today receives $1,000, the runner-up is $750, and the People's Choice Award will be $500. Uh, for those of you watching at home and for those of you in the audience, the People's Choice Award is your decision. Right after the last contestant presents today, on the screen and on your screen at home, you will see a number that you can text in your vote. There is no limit on the number of times you can vote for a person. Um, so moms, get your thumbs warmed up and get ready to vote. Uh, we, will, uh, we will be announcing that along with the winners of uh, the first and second place. So what I want to do, all of our contestants have done this multiple times, but I just want, for those of you who may not be familiar with 3MT, this is an international competition. Every major university in the country pretty much participates in this process. It's been around for quite a while, and we hope to send our winner to be very competitive at the regional level, which is the southern part of the United States. So if you take Texas, you draw a diagonal line all the way to Maryland, Everything below that is our region. And so we will be competing, our, having our representative there next week. I do want to take a minute to go over the rules. And the rules are based on the international competition. So all of our contestants today have prepared a single static slide. It cannot move, it cannot make noise, uh, it cannot have hyperlinks in it, uh, but it is up to them. They have, some of them have designed them themselves, some have had help, and some have just used pictures and other things to demonstrate their point. It's a very important part of that competition. One of the hardest parts of the competition is the three minutes, hence the name of the competition. So we watch it very closely in the back of the room for our contestants is a clock. And at the, uh, when that three minutes is up, you're going to hear this sound. If you hear that sound at the end and you go over, you're disqualified. And we're pretty mean about that. Um, if you start, and the way the contestants work, once I give them the cue to start, they will come out to the presentation platform here, either by a gesture or by a word, that's when the clock starts. If we have a technical problem and for some reason the clock doesn't start, you will hear, 
if you hear that, stop talking. We have a technical problem, okay? So remember, anytime you hear the bell, stop talking, okay? Um, and then we will reset the clock and ask you to reset your presentation. We'll give you a couple of minutes to get everything together, okay? <clears throat> I will say we have three judges that I'll introduce here in just a second, but their decision is final. Any of the, anything that goes on today, any decisions that are made, including the winners or disqualifications, whatever the judges decide uh, is final. Okay, and we'll go over, uh, we, I won't spend a lot of time on the criteria, but I will give you a minute. Uh, all of our contestants are very familiar with the criteria, but we're looking at basically having experts in these academic areas present their research to those of us who are not experts in those areas and having us get to understand it and to get excited about it and to want to know more about it, okay? And uh, these are the judging criteria, things that the judges are looking for, and basically the presentation skills. Uh, the slide, again, is a very important part of that. The judges will be taking the slide to the deliberation room, and they'll be taking a closer look at those slides as they talk about each of the contestants and their presentation and how it enhanced or not the presentation, okay? So let me take a minute and introduce our very distinguished panel of judges. We are fortunate. Uh, first of all, we have David Green. Uh, David is Media Relations Manager in the City of Austin. David, if you would wave to everybody, thank you. <clears throat> I should say all three of our judges are what I would consider communication experts. They've all been in the field of communication for a very long time. Um, I actually don't know if I know all of your academic credentials. Do any of you have uh, degrees in engineering? No? No? Uh, do any of you have degrees in pharmacy? No? How about the sciences? Okay, they are perfect for what we're doing today. All right. Um, our next judge is Judy Maggio, and I will say, Judy, I've been a fan for a long time. I've watched Judy on the Anchor of the Evening News and various news broadcasts, and so it is a real honor. And I know you're actually still affiliated with the university, some with KLRU, and so we are so happy to have Judy Maggio join us. It's nice for you to be here. And Gary Suswine is a good colleague, and I've enjoyed working with him over the years. And if you see things that come out of President Finviz's office, you can bet it has Gary's fingerprints on it. He is our chief communication guy for President Finviz, uh, has a wonderful team, and they make the university look really good. And so, and Gary told me if he has to leave today, it's not an insult to any of you. It just means there's something going on at the university that he needs to respond to. He's always on demand. So thank you, Gary. Okay, that's all I have to say. The contestants know how this works. We're not going to change it very much. From or We're not going to change it at all from the format yesterday. So we're going to get started here. Judges, I will ask for your cue in just a second to make sure you're ready. We'll begin the competition. Thanks again for being here. The federal government recently authorized $300 billion, with a B, over the next five years for spending on improving and constructing roadways in the United States. About 90% of those roadways will be asphalt pavements. When an asphalt pavement fails prematurely, not only does it cost a billion dollars, no, sorry, a million dollars per mile to reconstruct that road, of taxpayer money, but it's also one of the worst contributors to climate change and the destruction of the ozone layer. What you see up here is an asphalt pavement. That might be the kind that you like to drive on up at the top, but if you live in Austin, Texas, the one next to it might be more the kind you're used to driving on. These kind of damages have the cost that I have mentioned before and cost to you as vehicle owners in terms of damage to your vehicle. What can we do to prevent this? Well, my research aims to answer that question. 
a lot of the theory revolves around testing the asphalt mixture that goes into the pavement. Now, what is an asphalt mixture? Asphalt mixtures are made up of two components, primarily. You've got the aggregates, which are just a fancy name for rocks. And you've got the asphalt binder, which holds the aggregates together. You can think of it like a Rice Krispies treat. So the aggregates are the Rice Krispies. The binder is the delicious marshmallow that binds it. Now, when we think about cracking in asphalt pavements, the thing that actually causes cracks most of the time is the binder. What I'm doing in my lab is aiming to figure out how we can test the binders to better understand why and how they form cracks so that we can decide which binder we want to use before it ever goes out on the roadway and prevent those premature pavement failures. Down here, you'll see the result of what's called a poker chip test. It's a very simple test for testing asphalt binders. You put a little bit of the material between two steel plates, and you just pull it apart. You end up with a surface like that. My research, however, aims to go even deeper than that. We want to understand how do those cracks start forming before you ever see them at that scale. The photo next to it is an image of what we see when we use dark field microscopy, just a microscope with some crazy physics behind it, to understand when the cracks are forming. You can see at the beginning, and then you can see once we've applied a small load, some of those cracks open up just a little bit more. If we answer this question, where are those cracks coming from, before we can ever see them with the visible eye, we'll have a better understanding of how we can prevent them from happening and which binders we can choose that have the most resistance to forming microscopic cracks so that we never see macroscopic ones. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ari. Today, I brought you one question. What do you think is the number one cause of the death in America? It's not the cancer. It's not a traffic accident. The answer is ischemic disease. So what is this ischemic disease? Ischemic disease is defined by a disease caused by in a, a inadequate blood supply to the organ or a part of the body. Therefore, if it's happening at your head, it's going to cause a stroke. And if it's happening at your heart, it's going to cause a heart failure. And if it's happening at your limb of your body, it's going to cause a peripheral vascular disease. And this peripheral vascular disease is my target disease. When you need to think how to treat this disease, you first need to know why people develop this disease. One of the main reasons why people develop this disease is because of their bad eating habit. If you keep eating a fatty food, the fat or a lipid material will deposit on the wall of your blood vessel, and in this blood vessel will keep occluding, and eventually completely shut down your blood flow. The current golden standard of care for this disease is to literally reopening up your blood vessel by inserting a stenting or the balloon. However, this method is very invasive to your blood vessel, so that there is up to 40% of the chance that your blood vessel will re-occlude again. Therefore, we don't want to use this invasive method. But how to treat this disease without touching to the blood vessel? The answer is a protein therapy. In this protein therapy, all you need is to just inject your protein, and this protein will enhance our natural power to regenerate your blood vessel and then restore your blood flow. The name of this magical protein is called transmembrane stem cell factor, and this protein is usually used for regenerating your blood cell, and nobody wanted to use this protein to regenerate your blood vessel. But we tried it for the first time, and it was very successful. Here is some result of an animal study. We injected our protein to the ischemic mice leg and waited for 14 days for the recovery. 
The red indicate a lower bra flow, and then the blue indicate a higher bra flow. We can clearly see a significantly higher bra flow recovery in the treatment group than the control. We are now trying this protein on a rabbit model and I hope to achieve a good result in a human clinical trial. At the end, I would like to finish my presentation by saying that the future is not that far when we can treat this ischemic disease by just injecting the protein. Every time you stop at a gas station to fill up your tank, in Texas you pay an average of $5 in federal and state taxes. Every time that you go to the DMV to take a picture for your driver's license, you are paying taxes for infrastructure. Every time you forget to change the settings from uh, toll to no toll on your GPS and your phone routes you through a toll road, and you pay that dreaded $0.5 toll, you are paying for infrastructure. You are paying for pavements, you are paying for bridges, traffic lights, and roadway signs. In addition to oil revenues, in Texas alone, we are estimated to spend $70 billion on infrastructure development. I'll say that again, $70 billion. That means highway agencies need to decide what projects to do, when to do it, and where to do it. For example, do you fix I-35 or Mopac? Do you fix it this year or next year? Do you take the entire road off, or do you do some patchwork, like the potholes, and just fix it, and just wait? As part of making these decisions, it's important to account for the three goals of sustainable development. Environmental, equity, and economics. My research helps in developing mathematical optimization models to aid highway agencies in allocating $70 billion. Why is this problem complex? Well, because these three goals of sustainable development have conflicting relationships. We all want smoother roads, but the more we fix the roads, the more asphalt we use, the more concrete, aggregates, and all that increases greenhouse gas emissions. That also means we need to close down parts of the road, which leads to traffic delays, more fuel consumption, and more greenhouse gas emissions. My optimization model was able to determine that if we are intentional about the process of integrating these three goals of sustainable development in the budget allocation models, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by as much as 60 to 70 percent. We can improve equity by being more equitable, by up to 25% if we develop evaluation metrics, and we can also be cost effective while achieving these goals. My goal here is that the next time you pull up to a gas station to fill up your tank and you pay $5 in taxes, you know there's a guy here who's making sure it's spent in an economic way. Thank you. Oops, I always forget. I always forget. <laughs> I always forget. <laughs> Over 100 years ago, 
a woman by the name of Augusta Dieter walked into the office of Dr. Alwis Alzheimer, seeking treatment, noting that she had lost her mind. Upon her passing, an autopsy revealed severe atrophy of the brain and distinct plaques in its tissue. This was the first ever known diagnosed case of what we now call Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, those diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease today have no better chance at survival than Augusta did in the year 1901. Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States and is one of the few diseases that still cannot be prevented, slowed, or cured. In fact, every minute in America, one new person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Thus, this has led to a surge in scientific research over the past decade in this field. And yet, there still is no cure. Why? This is due to the complexity of the disease. You see, Alzheimer's disease is triggered by the aggregation of a protein called amyloid beta. Now, amyloid beta starts out as a singular protein, which we call a monomer. Yet in the disease state, these monomers begin to assemble into larger structures called oligomers. These oligomers then continue to build larger and larger structures, ultimately forming those plaques in the brain. Yet this mechanism that I've outlined for you here today is actually way more complex than this. And this is due to the fact that at each of these steps, the protein, the protein can take on a multitude of possible structures. The inability to identify these structures and to stabilize these structures is what has largely hindered effective therapeutic development. Thus, this is where my research comes in. In our lab, we use porous materials to influence this mechanism. Now, when we say a porous material, think of a sponge. A sponge has a bunch of tiny holes in it, and we use those holes to bind and encapsulate the protein. Yet, in my research, instead of using a sponge, we use chemically functionalized porous silica. Now, this basically means that we have chemical groups and metal ions that have an affinity for the protein, and we bind that to the surface of our porous silica to direct this mechanism. Most notably, we have found that we are able to influence oligomer, oligomer formation such that it is unable to aggregate to further larger products. In addition to that, we have found that by modifying the chemical groups and the pore sizes, we are able to influence the size and structure of the resulting aggregates. This has major implications for therapeutic development and that now allows for them to have a target to design therapeutics for. During the time it has taken for me to give you this talk, three more people in the United States have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. It is my hope that with this research and similar research, this can become a statistic of the past. Thank you. It has been less than 100 years since we developed the first true antibiotic, penicillin, which has saved over 200 million lives in its brief history. But unfortunately, as biology does, these bacteria are evolving to resist the antibiotics that we use to fight against them, a problem known as antibiotic resistance. It is predicted that by 2050, nearly 10 million deaths per year will be caused by antibiotic resistance, even outpacing cancer mortality rates. Even more, within the last year, the World Health Organization has reported, quote, a serious lack of new antibiotics under development for the growing threat of antibiotic resistance. So my personal journey with this problem was spurred on when my grandma was hospitalized when I was in high school. She was being treated for liver failure and became infected with MRSA, a highly resistant strain of bacteria. The infection significantly weakened her immune system and she passed away a few weeks later. To tackle antibiotic resistance, I am engineering yeast to brew new, better antibiotics. But what makes our antibiotics better? Well, my lab has developed certain genetic tools that allow us to randomize the antibiotics that we're making with our yeast. So what this means is that 
Sometimes we'll make a great new antibiotic, but oftentimes we'll make bad ones because we have this huge randomized pool. So the question then becomes, how do we sort through to find the best antibiotics? We do this by blowing bubbles. So imagine what happens when you blow a bubble. There's air, air becomes trapped within the bubble, right? But we have an instrument in our lab where instead of trapping air within these bubbles, we can actually trap one yeast and one bacteria cell which is pretty incredible. So if we zoom in on one of these bubbles, what we see is we have our engineered yeast, the good guys, producing an antibiotic, and we have our bacteria, the bad guys, fighting for their lives in what we like to call bubble battles. So there are two outcomes of a bubble battle, right? The, bacter the bacteria either die or survive, depending upon how effective the antibiotic is. And so we can sort through millions of these bubbles at once. And we've developed a system where the bubbles actually glow if the bacteria are dying. So that tells us if we have an effective antibiotic. But the real beauty of this system is not just that we can find one antibiotic for a single strain of bacteria, like the MRSA that weakened my grandma's immune system. We can find antibiotics that are effective against any strain of bacteria using this system. Antibiotic resistance can affect anybody at any time. And I don't want any of you to lose a loved one to an issue like this. So using this bubble sorting technique and my newly empowered yeast, we can now fast track a solution to the global issue of antibiotic resistance. Thank you. <laughs> Almost ran away. <laughs> In 2016, Congress passed the Cancer Moonshot Shot Initiative. Sorry. John? We'll try again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In 2016, Congress passed the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. Now, the idea was ambitious, but clear, that the country that put a man on the moon could, if we applied the same resources, energy, and charisma, find a cure for cancer. But I actually think the analogy between cancer treatment and space travel goes far deeper than that. You see, when we develop new therapeutic treatments for cancer, we typically invent new molecules. Then we go through a sequence of tests to determine how effective each of those molecules is at killing tumors. Now, that's a needle and haystack paradigm at best, and we act surprised when those molecules we develop are only modestly effective. We were able to reach the moon not when we found a single miraculous part, but when we rationally combined many parts. Engines, sure, but also platforms, pumps, wings, and more. I apply this same logic in my research, but to the problem of treating cancer. I develop new therapeutic materials for cancer. Specifically, I develop nanoparticles that are combinations of multiple therapeutic molecules in an effort to combine the things that are the best about each of those individual molecules. In the example shown here, I combine a targeting molecule that targeting molecule is optimized to recognize surface characteristics of a tumor so that it can target it. But I combine it with an environmentally responsive molecule that is able in circulation to bind very tightly to chemotherapeutics. But when inside the cell, it releases it, allowing it to treat that cell. Now, in the absence of the targeting molecule, the, the particle containing chemo drugs would distribute to all cells, deliver within all of them, kill all of them it would still be nonspecific, giving the same side effects we have today. The therapeutic molecule by itself could detect the tumor very well. 
but in the absence of the drug and the responsive molecule, it would be unable to deliver it. Only together are they both therapeutic and specific. In the first three years of my thesis, I focused on platform development. I optimized my new chemistry shown here and demonstrated that in proof of concept that we could get optimal amounts of targeting and environmentally responsive components. In the final two years, I invented new tests to determine how this material will perform in blood circulation, in healthy tissue, in tumor cells, and once it enters the individual cancer cells. I believe that in the future, it will be a modular and rational combination of multiple therapeutics that is a cure for cancer, not a single miracle drug. Thank you. Daniel was a 29-year-old healthy young man. He went swimming in the pool with his girlfriend one beautiful afternoon. He dove into the pool, and in one tragic second, he hit the edge of the pool and shattered his spine. As a result of that incident, he injured his spinal cord, lost his ability to walk and swim. He has to sit on a wheelchair. He can move his arms, but he's lost his hand function. Among everything that he's lost in that one second, which one do you think he misses the most? The ability to move his fingers by his own will. In fact, when surveyed, about 80% of tetraplegics, meaning people who have lost function in both arms and legs after a spinal cord injury, rated hand function to be the number one factor that would improve their quality of life. This ranking was comparable to voluntary bowel and bladder movement. Without hand function, the most basics of daily activities, such as eating and showering, are severely affected, let alone the fancier tasks, right, like writing or shuffling cards. Throughout the years, assistive devices were developed to help these people regain partial independence. Earlier devices included reachers with only open and closed functions. Later on, more complex devices were developed that could move different joints of the finger, like the one from my lab. However, pure advancements in mechanical design without clever control methods have not proven sufficient to even come close to the dexterity levels of humans. This is where my research comes in, to act as the brains for these fancy fingers. I have worked to develop accurate mathematical models of the fingers the assistive device, the object of manipulation, and the interactions between them. These models explain the mappings between the control commands, finger movements, and the positions and forces at the fingertips. This means I can send the right commands to the motors to locate the fingertips in desired positions in three-dimensional space and to provide just the right forces at the fingertips to fulfill a task. Whether it's grasping a hammer, or holding a dandelion. With this, not only we can do simple grasps with opening and closing of the fingers, but also we enable fine grasping and dexterous manipulation. Hopefully, this will help people with hand disabilities regain independence in grasping and manipulation tasks. Who knows, maybe one day, spinal cord injury will not keep Danielle from being the dealer in a poker game on a beautiful afternoon. Thank you.
14.5 million hours. That is the amount of time people in the United States lost stuck in traffic in 2014. That's equivalent to 42 hours per working person every year. So a question for us is, how do we solve congestion? Express lanes, which are the focus of my research, are one of the tools on our path to a congestion-free world. These lanes provide reliable travel time in exchange for a toll. However, toll operators and transportation planners face a challenge on how to operate these lanes so we can actually reduce everyone's delay. The recent headlines show that in Washington, these lanes are moving 15 miles per hour slower than what was planned. And in Virginia, the toll rates have reached as high as $47. Paying for that is like buying a new pair of shoe every time you go from home to work. The key culprit in this is our lack of understanding of how drivers behave. At every fork in the road shown by the red arrow, a driver has to decide whether to pay the toll and hop onto the fast lane or gamble for a lower toll at a future entry point. So drivers make what I call sequential decisions. These decisions are influenced by several factors, like how urgently you want to reach your destination, what is your income level, what information your phone app is telling you, and sometimes just your mood. And the current pricing algorithms ignore this behavior and use simpler rules of thumb, like increase the toll when there is high traffic and decrease otherwise which can be far from efficient, as these headlines show. So this is the focus of my research. Improve the efficiency of existing express lane operations so we can reduce everyone's delay. I focus on two stages. First, borrowing the tools from computer science research on analyzing the sequential decisions, I develop improved driver behavior model. These models can predict how a driver with different characteristics, like high income or low income, will make different decisions. Second, I use this model to improve the tolling algorithms. The key to a better algorithm is predicting how a toll, say 50 cents, is gonna impact the congestion differently than a different toll, say $2. I incorporate this and optimize over the toll set. And I, when I test it on the Dallas Express Lane in Dallas, my algorithm generates, uh, saves each traveler four hours of travel over a peak period. That is four hours every year more than the existing algorithms. This safe time can lead to reduced vehicular emissions by up to 10 to 15% and more happier drivers. And guess what? The maximum toll charged is only $2.5. So even though we cannot turn back the clock, my research can bring back to you some of those 42 hours. So you can spend it on things that you would truly care about. Thank you. I'd like to start off by asking you all a question. How many of you guys have ever experienced a burn while cooking on the stove? Raise your hand. It's quite common, right? And quite painful. So now I want you to imagine that you're inside of your vehicle, but you're trapped. You're unable to move or escape. The car is quickly catching on fire, and it's only a matter of seconds before your body is covered in blistering burns. Well, you might think, well, how often does this actually happen? Well, it actually happens more than you think. Over 60% of all U.S. hospitalizations are burn-related. Unfortunately, when our body is compromised in such a way, it initiates a cytokine storm, which you see here. These are small molecules within our body that activate an immune response. The immune response is triggered by infection and causes swelling of the tissues, as you see here. Unfortunately, for these people who arrive at the hospital with the severe burns, they uh, end up acquiring 
uh, this infection, and it's normally due to organ failure and sepsis. Now, sepsis is another slew of problems, and I'll describe exactly what that is. Sepsis can be described as a blood poisoning condition, which is normally caused by pathogenic bacterial, viral, or fungal infections. When these people arrive at the hospital, they acquire uh, sepsis because they've lost their protective barrier, their skin, as you see here. And unfortunately, their body has activated an immune response. For these people, the mortality rate races from 40% to 60% and continues to increase as much as 7% for every hour that it is left untreated. This means that if you were stuck in that vehicle, the chances of you surviving are slim. Now that I've described the problem, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we're doing to solve it. My research is dedicating, dedicated to identifying genetic and protein markers that are in the blood that are key indicators of onset sepsis. To better understand these biomarkers, blood samples will be taken from patients upon arrival to the hospital and every six hours until they have either recovered or acquired sepsis. Over time, we will generate a list of these biomarkers and compare their genetic expression levels to those people who did not get sepsis. As you can see here, this graph represents in the black bars the genetic expression levels of the persons who got sepsis and is being compared to those who did not in the gray bars. By identifying a signature profile for these biomarkers, we will learn to early detect sepsis, giving physicians an opportunity to treat and prevent this deadly condition. Thank you. Hi everyone, we are lucky to be living in an era where capturing memories and forms of images and videos is possible. It happens sometimes that the video we capture looks shaky or looks distorted, so we end up deleting it later on. Wouldn't have been great if our phone notified us that, hey, the video you just captured looks distorted? In many instances, recapturing the same scene is possible and hence those memories don't get lost. My goal in my PhD is to achieve that by measuring automatically video quality in a fast yet reliable way. This problem is actually important to many people besides consumers. For instance, think about engineers working hard to create, trying to create for us better and better cameras. They also need a way to evaluate video quality reliably, right? So, how to measure video quality? What I was able to find was that if we take a video and we process it the same way our human visual system does, and then we look at the statistics, this can provide very relevant information related to quality. For instance, the statistics of good quality videos are very different than the statistics of bad quality videos. So I used this information to build a new model that can automatically predict video quality for me. The next question was, does this model work? In order to answer that, I needed a database that contains videos and associated quality scores. I created the largest video quality assessment database because everything's bigger in Texas and because we want a database that represents the real world videos in a good way, meaning that it is diverse enough in terms of the content and also encounter distortions. The database that I built had around 600 videos captured by more than 100 devices by 80 different users that have different expertise and shooting styles. The scenes in my videos came from 45 different countries and also from a space shuttle to make sure that our friends in the outer space are as well covered. The next step was to obtain these quality scores. To do so, I launched a survey where more than 5,000 5, participants across all the five continents provided me with quality scores. 
This resulted in more than 200,000 quality scores. With this very large and very representative video quality assessment database, I was able to verify that the model that I built allows me to predict the scores of the videos in a reliable and also in a fast way, and hence being able to notify the users when a distortion in the video occurs will soon be possible. Thank you so much. Okay, let's give one more round of applause to all of our contestants. Thank you. We now have an opportunity to uh, vote for the People's Choice Award. We're going to ask the judges to wrap up their notes and we're going to go back to the deliberation room. Uh, the People's Choice Award, if you go to this website, uh, will be open for the next 15 minutes. So you have 15 minutes to go in and vote for your favorite uh, presenter today. It'll be closed in 15 minutes, okay? Judges, uh, and then we should have your results. I think that we'll probably be back here in about 45 minutes to an hour. So we will be live streaming. Any of the contestants that can join us then, we hope you will. We hope all of you will come back and join us again in 45 minutes or so. Okay? Thanks a lot. Our uh, esteemed social media guru here, get us all set. Okay, looks like we're ready to go. So let me just say that uh, you know, I've watched many of you present two or three times. All of you today, you took it up a notch. And some of you, I think I even told you, like, that was your best time yet. And I meant that because you guys really stepped it up. I was really proud today. Thank you for taking all the feedback. Those of you who did the work, came to the workshop, came to the dry runs. You listened. You did good. You incorporated all that. And I think it paid off for you. So um, what I'd like to do now moving forward is I just want to thank our judges one more time because they had a tough job. So thank you all. <laughs> and I want to ask our judges to come down as we announce the winners since they made the hard decision. Okay, and so, and then I'll let uh, the guys with the cameras back there tell us where you want people stationed right here in front of our, I think, okay. So we're going to start with the People's Choice Award. Uh, this is a, uh, it's not really a popularity vote, but in some ways it is, because people get to vote on who they liked. I will say, a lot of you rallied a lot of support out there, hundreds of people. Uh, I don't remember, Daniel, how many people voted in People's Choice overall? 350 people. That was some good. That was some good votes. Um, so um, our People's Choice Award this year goes to uh, Venkatesh Pandey. So yay, People's Choice. So come down, congratulations, and uh, that's a $500 prize. So we're very pleased. And so we're going to get some pictures here with our judges, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> okay. We got them? Okay. So our, our second place um, was decided by our judges, and uh, this person in the event that the first place winner can't go represents at regionals will represent the University of Texas at the regional competition. So Michael Lucas, you are our second place winner. So come down. Uh, congratulations. $750 for Michael, so not bad. Get some pictures with our judges.
And the winner of this year's 2019 3MT at the University of Texas goes to Kevin Reed. Kevin, <laughs> congratulations. Yeah, now if we can have all, th and thank, thank you to everyone for coming, really appreciate it. Again, if you're not graduating, I look forward to seeing you next year uh, in the competition. It was very impressive today. So let's give them a round of applause. Thanks, everybody. So if our winners uh, will come down, we're going to do some more photographs uh, as a group.